Hi, everyone. My name is Colleen Hatcher, and I am the Senior Manager of Community Relations at the National Down Syndrome Society. And we are thrilled to be a part of this webinar this evening with one of our board members, John Cronin, who will share his story a little later on. The National Down Syndrome Society is the leading human rights organization for all individuals with Down Syndrome. And we envision a world in which individuals with Down Syndrome are able to achieve their dreams, live with their peers, and have full and meaningful careers. We, just a heads up, some housekeeping for this webinar tonight, we will take questions from the audience. So please make sure you're putting the questions in the question box and we will answer those as we go through the session this evening. We have some great panelists. We're going to talk about some amazing pieces and we're excited to have you all here with us. Uh, Mary, I'm going to turn it over to you to introduce yourself and talk a little bit more about why we're here tonight. Thanks, Colleen. My name is Mary Pruden and I'm the Executive Director of National Keratoconus Foundation. I'm just delighted to help celebrate Down Syndrome Awareness Month with this special presentation focusing on eye diseases and vision disorders that affect differently abled individuals. This year we partnered with NDSS on their Buddy Walk and we look forward to many more collaborations in the future. National Keratoconus Foundation, where I work, is a patient outreach program located on the campus of the University of California, Irvine, which is about 15 miles and 20 minutes from Disneyland. <laughs> and KCF works with doctors around the globe to spread awareness and understanding of this eye disease. It is the oldest and largest keratoconus focused organization in the world. Keratoconus affects the shape of the cornea, that clear outer portion of the eye that's normally round and symmetric. For those with keratoconus, the tissue is weak and changes shape, causing blurring, double vision, and streaks or halos around lights. You'll learn today that keratoconus impacts all people, but it's especially prevalent in the, in the um, Down syndrome community. NKCF publishes four newsletters a year and holds bi-monthly webinars. I hope you'll sign up to join us for future um, meetings and learn more about this eye disease that you share and that you share the information with other parents and caregivers. We're happy to send you our booklets with more information on keratoconus. Here's, here's what we'll send out to anybody who's interested. And check out our website, nkcf.org. Tonight, we've invited two eye doctors who are national experts working in the special needs community. Our first speaker, Dr. Donnie Saw, is professor of ophthalmology at UC Irvine. He is chief of the Division of Pediatric Ophthalmology, and he's on the teaching faculty at Children's Hospital of Orange County. He's a graduate of the Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, and he completed his ophthalmology residency at the Medical College of Wisconsin in Milwaukee. Following that, he took additional training in pediatric ophthalmology at the prestigious Wilmer Eye Institute in Baltimore, part of Johns Hopkins University. Dr. Saw is acknowledged as one of the leading pediatric ophthalmologists in the country with appointments to several national panels and committees. He works with clinicians to establish best practices. He's an active participant with Orbis, that's the Flying Eye Hospital, and he's been on missions to Asia, South America, and Africa, where he teaches local doctors how to perform eye surgery, and he oversees eye surgery on patients who, who come to the, to the uh, Flying Hospital. For 20 years, he was on the medical staff at the Children's Hospital of Omaha, and he held an endowed chair in ophthalmology at the University of Nebraska's Medical Center. Dr. Saw has been named a top doc by several publications and societies. Last year, he was the Citizen of the Year by the Omaha Rotary Club. Since his recent move to Southern California, he's continued to make connections in the community and share his expertise. I'm just delighted that Dr. Saw is with us today and will give us an overview of some of the vision and eye problems 
that parents and caregivers should be thinking about for their children with Down syndrome. Welcome, Dr. Saul. Thank you very much, Mary. Um, can you hear me okay? I can hear you, terrific. Perfect, and I think perfect. everyone else can. All right. Thank you. And Mary, thank you very much. And Colleen, thank you for this uh, great invitation. Uh, can you see my slides okay as well? Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and get started here. Again, I've, I've, I've worked at the uh, in here in Irvine for University of California, and I truly want to thank you um, for this opportunity. So I'm going to, you know, I was given 15 minutes to talk about the, uh, the some of the things that can happen in Down syndromes in the eye. So I'm going to go pretty quickly because there are unfortunately a lot of things that can go wrong. Um, so just to let's start with the anatomy of the eyeball. So we have the 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 cornea, which is the clear front structure we're going to talk a little bit more about. So right behind the lens, then we have the, the iris, which is the color portion of the eye, and then we have the lens right behind it, and then we got the retina, which is like the film in a camera that takes pictures. And then, then of course, behind the eyeball, uh, we have this optic nerve where the pictures are sent directly to the back of the brain, and it actually is a very long and um, tortuous process and it actually encompasses a significant portion of the brain and so a, a clear vision in early ages is extremely important for the brain development um, and because 70 to 80 percent of the the learning occurs with visual presentation in pediatric patients so it is very very critical and also when we're looking at things, uh, you know, we don't see things in two dimension like we're doing right now on Zoom. Everything's in three dimension. And that happens because we have six muscles on the right and six muscles on the left. And these 12 muscles work in perfect synchrony. Um, I'm gonna move, I'm gonna get rid of my, perfect. I'm, it works in perfect synchrony and it actually moves together. Um, for us to see. And then that happens with the help of third, fourth, and sixth cranial nerves, which is in the center portion of the brain. And of course, the, the vision um, is, uh, is actually um, um, is transmitted through the optic nerve, which is right there. So what are some of the common ocular findings that can occur in Down syndromes? So first of all, in order for us to be able to see what's going on, we use various uh, tools. We have slimps, we have, uh, we have an injured ophthalmoscope, we have various tools, and that helps us to see exactly what's going on. Um, and first, let's start from the front and then all the way to the back. Uh, blepharitis, it just means that it's an inflammation of the eyelid, both upper and lower lid. And unfortunately, this is extremely common. And, um, and it can actually be pretty devastating depending on the severity. Um, and fortunately, with the help of baby shampoos and lid scrubbing, and along with medications, this can many times be under control, but sometimes you actually have to see an eye doctor uh, to get that addressed. And also the tear duct, just like the ear tubes, uh, just like the, uh, the, uh, the uh, ear issues, the, uh, the tear duct, in patients with Down syndrome can actually be somewhat narrow and also tortuous, and it can get clogged very easily, so everything just gets backed up. So blocked tear duct can be a big problem and causing infections. And so the way we uh, solve this problem is by us going into the tear duct and opening the tear duct area. And fortunately, the success rate of these procedures are relatively high, they're not as high as non-Down syndrome patients, but in Down syndrome patients, the success rate can be as low as 70 to 80%, and it's not unusual for them to have repeat surgeries. And second, um, um, another problem that's common is misalignment. Uh, uh, here in the States, uh, we typically see what we call esotropia, where the eyes tend to cross. Uh, as you can see, if you take a picture of your child, and you see one reflex, uh, kind of like a dark red, and the other the, the other eye has a, a brighter red color, that's a no-no. That's a sign that the one eye may actually be misaligned. Or if you're looking at the right reflex, and as you can see here, the light reflex is right in the center on the left eye, 
but the red eye, you see how it's displaced laterally. So that's a sign the eyes are not straight. But in different countries, like for example, in Asia, the, it's the exotropia that tends to be more common. Now, in patients with Down syndrome with the prominent skin folds, sometimes it can be very difficult to see if the eyes are truly crossed or not. Um, so especially in um, Asians, um, the, uh, the, uh, it, it can be somewhat difficult to tell if the eyes are crossed or not. So you may actually have to get an uh, actual eye examination by a specialist. And second, another thing that's common, that can be common is nystagmus, where the eyes tend to shift or jump. You've seen like patients with the eyes jumping like this. So it can, it can move in different directions. It can be horizontal or it can be vertical, or it can actually be torsional or rotational as well. In patients with the Down syndrome, the nystagmus, I wanna say about 90% of the time is typically horizontal. It's a horizontal nystagmus and it can be present up to 33% of the patients. Next is a refractive error. So in normal eye, the image falls right in the center portion of the retina we call the, we call the phobia, which is like right here. The, the image falls and it actually all the light converges right on the phobia. If the light converges front of the phobia, then you have what we call myopia. If the light converges behind the phobia, then we call it hyperopia. Another synonym for that is farsightedness. And also astigmatism, astigmatism is something that we have to be concerned about. So front surface of the eye is shaped like the cornea is shaped more like a, 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 a soup spoon. But in patients with astigmatisms, and many patients with Down syndromes too, uh, actually have a cornea that's shaped more like a teaspoon, that's more elliptical. So, and for that, they typically would require glasses. And we actually have various types of tools that can help us to determine if the child needs glasses or not. And in patients with Down syndrome, because of the flat nasal bridge, like myself here, uh, you really need to work with opticians who are familiar of fitting pa with patients with Down syndrome to get them perfectly fitted. And I think this is extremely critical. Another problem that the, uh, the, uh, that's actually common is accommodation. What does that mean? So when you're trying to focus on a book, like for example, like when you're trying to read and look in a book, as that image gets closer and closer, your eyes, your eye muscles actually inside the eye actually uh, have to work harder for you to focus. But these muscles, if they do not work perfectly, then you can actually have a blurred image as that image comes closer and closer. So when they're trying to read, they can actually have problem with reading. And this is an accommodative problem and it can, uh, we can actually help them with glasses with bifocals, and it is suspected up to 70 to 90% of the patients with Down syndrome have accommodative issues. So they, uh, that's one of the reasons why they need to have good eye exams. And also this is what the normal lens, the, the converging lens uh, looks like inside the eye. But um, many patients with Down syndrome, up to uh, five to 10% of the patients can actually have these different types of cataracts. It's like a multifocal opacities and can obstruct the vision. And if they obstruct the vision enough and compromise the vision, then sometimes we would have to go in and get the cataract and put a new lens in. Um, and also here's a patient with what we call ectropion, where the eyelids are pointing outward, uh, resulting in significant uh, uh, dry eyes and corneal scars. You can actually see the scars forming right here in the left eye. So to prevent that uh, and to prevent ex exacerbation, we actually close the eyelid shut partially that we call parasorophy. So that's uh, what we do. And it actually has a relatively high success rate. It's not 100%, but it can help with a significant exposure keratopathy or exposed cornea that's causing corneal scars. In general, the recommended eye examination is that the within the first six months of age, and then annual eye exam till five, and then after five, biannual eye examination um, um, 
uh, between six to 13 years of age. And after that, it, it's at the discretion of the eye doctors. And I truly want to thank you for this opportunity. And I, I you know, I, I would love to go into details of uh, these findings, but of course that would take a lot of time. But I just wanted to kind of give you an overview of what are some of the things that can go wrong with the eye. And if you have any specific questions, I'd be happy to entertain them now, or I'd be happy to, uh, if you actually contact uh, myself, uh, I'd be happy to answer those questions as well. Thank you. That was great. Uh, doctor, we got a few questions. Um, here's one. Uh, my son was prescribed eyeglasses several years ago, but rarely uses them. Will this make his eyesight worse? So do you have any I, tips for getting people to wear their glasses or it does it is it going to impact vision? Sure. I'm going to stop sharing my slides so I can see everybody. Can I do that? Yep. Um, how do I do that? Or you guys could um, do that for me? Yep, it's all done. Right? It's all done? Okay, oh, perfect, okay. So I'm going to take this down. Okay, can you hear me okay? Absolutely. Yeah, sure. Um, so the, um, the like I've actually alluded to, it's extremely important that, that you actually go to the um, optician who's actually very familiar with the uh, the fitting of the the, the glasses. Uh, I think that's truly the key. Uh, you know, finding the right people who actually know how to deal with the uh, patients with uh, with Downs, with the uh, with the nasal bridge, and also the ear positions can be actually different too. So get the glasses that's correctly fitted for your child that's comfortable. I think that's extremely important. And as I alluded to uh, earlier, if you, do not wear the pro if you do not wear the proper prescription and if your child needs them, unfortunately, it can make your, it can actually impact the vision long-term. So you can make things worse, yes. Oh, okay. Are yeah. there um, eyeglasses that are made for Down syndrome individuals? Uh, yes, of course. Yes, yes. Okay. They're actually specially designed uh, uh, glasses for Down syndrome. Uh, so as you can see here, sorry, I cannot see any of you guys. I wish I could see you. Um, okay. I... We, can, we can see you. I wish I could see you guys. Uh, could... Maybe, maybe you're going to make your um, webcam visible? If this is a, a format that I'm not very familiar with, but anyway, okay, anyway, so um, you can see me, right? Yes. Yeah, so this is a nasal, <clears throat> this is a bridge, like when you wear the glasses, this nasal bridge is uh, typically, it's a place at the top, and uh, glasses that are designed for Down syndrome, it's actually reversed, it's actually, uh, this portion of the glass is actually lower, so lower. you actually, um, yeah, it's actually much lower. Um, and, um, and it also accommodates a flatter, uh, flatter nasal bridge, like myself. Um, okay. So it's, mu it's much more comfortable. And, and as far as uh, tips to get a parent to get a child to wear glasses, do you have any uh, suggestions there? Or is that uh, something that you just think that comfort uh, will will make it easier. Uh, yeah, yeah. So there are three things that you can do. Uh, so one is that the first, uh, like I said, make the glasses comfortable, and number two, make sure the glasses are correct. Um, so you know, as as I've alluded to earlier, uh, you know, the cooperation can be somewhat limited uh, in some patients with Downs. Um, so getting the best eye examination. Uh, possible by someone who's familiar with patients with Downs and other uh, Downs is actually, I think, is, is, is critical. So getting the proper prescription is actually uh, is extremely important. And third is that we can actually use eye drops in the eye to make them blurred um, for a short period of time, which encourages them to wear the glasses. So without the glasses, with the, with the, without the glasses, things are blurred. So they would actually have to wear the glasses to make things um, clear. So we actually oh. have drops for that. That's interesting. This yeah. is a question that's somewhat related. Um, this woman writes, my son is 14 years old and not very verbal. He also gets anxious when we go to the doctor. Is it possible to get a good eye exam if he's not very cooperative? Um, so 
you know, obviously, um, more cooperative the patient, uh, easier the examinations, and we can actually acquire more information. Um, but the uh, the answer to that question is that the even with a complete uh, a lack of cooperation, we can actually acquire uh, uh, pretty much most of the information pretty accurately. Yes. So um, even if, if someone's nonverbal, you're able to oh, yes, get... Oh, yes, yes, yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <clears throat> so um, they fortunately, the Down syndrome patients, for the most part, they're, you know, uh, they're happy, they're, you know, they're, they're um, you know, they're uh, interactive. Uh, but the some of the other patients, the the uh, we actually have patients with other types of uh, chromosomal abnormalities like the trisomy 13 and 18. Uh, these patients are um, can be very challenging. But even for those patients with the right skills and right right tools, you can actually get a, um, a reliable examination and okay. information. Yes, that's terrific. Yeah. Well. Um, thank you. I, if we have any questions that come in, we'll try to do them at the end. But um, thank you for that overview of uh, some some of the eye conditions that we should be thinking about and watching for, um, uh, and the treatments that that uh, are available. It's it's good news that there's lots of uh, corrections available. Thank you. So our our second speaker tonight is a longtime friend of the National Keratoconus Foundation. Dr. Ann Ostrowski is a graduate of Albany Medical School and completed her ophthalmology residency at Mount Sinai Medical Center in New York. She then took additional training in refractive surgery and cornea disease at New York Eye and Ear Infirmary, where she participated in some of the early studies involving cornea crosslinking. It was about five years ago that she contacted National Keratoconus Foundation and we discussed her passion for the Down syndrome community. I remember that phone call very well, because you don't get them very often. <laughs> Dr. Ostrowski um, noted that individuals with Down syndrome have irregu irregular corneas and are at higher risk for, cor for keratoconus, and she was interested in focusing on helping these patients. Dr. Ostrowski is a assistant professor at the Langone NYU Medical Center, where she heads their Keratocona Center. She also serves as chief of the ophthalmology service at Bellevue Hospital. She was instrumental in, re in launching the Down Syndrome program at NYU, where the eye care of pediatric patients uh, is coordinated with other medical specialties. Dr. Ostrowski was one of the first eye doctors to perform cross-linking on special needs patients and right now, about a third of her practice is dedicated to these differently abled individuals. She's often call, called upon to give advice and assistance to other doctors who are treating Down syndrome patients in their own practice. Dr. Ostrowski, I know this, this webinar has been one of your, your dreams for a while. You have been an advocate for educating the Downs community about the increased risk of keratoconus. And so I'm happy to turn it over for you to tell the story. Mary, thank you so much. I want to make sure you can hear me well. I can hear you and we can see your um, uh, uh, slides. We're, okay. You're all set. Wonderful. Okay, thank you so much and thank you everybody um, for having me today. Um, so uh, my talk is going to specifically uh, focus on the condition of keratoconus. So we'll go over uh, what the condition is, uh, why it is of special consequence in patients um, with Down syndrome, and what we can do for it, what kind of medical treatments we can offer um, for, for this condition. So um, as Dr. Sa has described uh, the anatomy of the eye so beautifully in the beginning of the talk, uh, the cornea is the front of the eye, um, and it is normally round um, like a sort of bubble window on a submarine. What happens in keratoconus is that the cornea, uh, the corneal integrity becomes less rigid. It becomes softer and more malleable and actually starts to deform. And it actually starts to take on a shape of a cone rather than a sphere or a half sphere. Um, this condition uh, can lead to visual decline and sometimes even blindness. Um, there is a genetic predisposition um, 
to this condition. Um, there are some studies out there suggesting actually that uh, a gene that codes for collagen, um, which can be present also on uh, the 21st gene, uh, chromosome uh, is um, could be responsible. And so if you look at the, the general population prevalence of keratoconus is about 0.001%. But the incidence of keratoconus um, in patients who have Down syndrome is higher than that, significantly higher than that. Um, this condition not only has a genetic predisposition, but can also be made worse or triggered by certain environmental triggers, which we'll talk about. So this is sort of a, a pictorial description of what I just uh, described to you. The normal cornea, this is in cross-section, um, you know, has this sort of nice, smooth, spherical appearance. It looks like this bubble window in a submarine. And it is the main optical surface of the eye that's responsible for taking the light that comes from outside and focusing it um, to, uh, sharply on the retina, which will then allow for a sharp image to form. You can see in keratoconus, the cornea really starts to look more like a cone, and this condition is progressive. Uh, this is an artist's rendition of what it would be, uh, what the perception would be to have uh, keratoconus. So forgive the, the image, which is not HD, but on the left, a pretty clear image there with normal vision. And then you could see the progressive blurring that happens with mild keratoconus and then with significant keratoconus. Uh, significant keratoconus, where the images just really become washed out and blurred. So some things that we look for when, uh, you know, when I'm seeing a patient um, uh, who has uh, either Down syndrome or who has a known corneal condition or decreased vision, um, we do talk to the parents and say, or the loved ones and say, are there any cues um, uh, that are nonverbal that you are seeing uh, your child do? For example, um, are, does it look like they're seeing worse than before? Are they um, squinting to see? Are they, are they telling you that you know things are not as clear? Uh, are they moving up closer to certain objects to, to get a you know a clearer look? These are all nonverbal cues um, that parents or caregivers can pick up on and will tell us as physicians that they're noticing these behaviors in their uh, loved ones. Um, other other things that are important are conditions such as uh, that cause eye rubbing, like allergies, um, or conditions of uh, such as blepharitis, which we have uh, discussed before uh, from Dr. Su's uh, talk. Um, all of these things and eye rubbing can make the condition worse or can actually bring it on in patients who are predisposed. Um, obviously, having a history uh, of an eye condition, such as keratoconus, is also something that we look for. And then we also look, uh, once the patient is in our office, we look for certain things on the eye exam, um, you know, to help us make the diagnosis. So uh, objectively, we look at vision and we try to figure out, is the vision decreased? Um, we also look for classical clinical signs at the slit lamp microscope on the eyeball itself uh, that are typical of keratoconus. And lastly, we also do imaging, special imaging of the cornea, photographs that are called corneal topography that would demonstrate classical uh, characteristics of this condition. So as Dr. Sa has also shared with you in his talk, uh, we use um, this microscope machine that magnifies uh, the eyeball and we are able to see very typical findings on exam um, in keratoconus. This is an example of this special picture that I talked to you about. This is a corneal topography map that corneal specialists and some general ophthalmologists do to see whether the surface of the cornea is regular. Uh, the topographical map of the cornea is uh, not asimilar to a topographical map of land where things are, you know, there are elevations and depressions. And there are very classical patterns that we can see in conditions like keratoconus that would confirm to us that. Um, there's an irregular shape to the cornea. Um, some very important things um, to talk about associated conditions that can actually make this condition worse if it already exists, or actually even bring this condition on in predisposed individuals. Um, allergies, which are present in about 30% of, of patients uh, uh, with keratoconus, um, and they can cause eye rubbing. 
um, blepharitis, which we have discussed, um, and any behavioral issue where eye rubbing is really a habit. Um, those are all possible contributors. So what do we do um, when we know that somebody has keratoconus? Um, the first thing we obviously want to do is try to improve the vision as much as possible. And we always start with fitting patients with glasses. At some point, the glasses no longer help because the cornea is too irregular. And so we go to contact lenses. Um, and those uh, contact lenses are not the soft ones that most people are used to. They're actually rigid, hard contact lenses made of um, more dense materials like glass um, or you know, denser types of plastics. Um, once that no longer works, or if that's not an option for visual improvement, we can also consider transplanting the cornea and actually replacing it with a normal uh, corneal curvature. Uh, obviously, corneal transplantation is a big surgery, and it's something we would like to avoid if at all possible, but it does exist as an option to improve vision uh, in patients who have lost it due to very, very advanced disease. Um, what we do have now that we didn't have 10 years ago is a um, procedure that can actually stabilize the keratoconus and prevent it from getting worse and prevent the vision from deteriorating. And that's called corneal collagen crosslinking. And we'll talk an, uh, about this procedure in some detail shortly. But frequently, if we see that we monitor the patients over time and we see whether their uh, keratoconus is progressive or stable, if it's stable, then all we do is monitor and we treat the vision with glasses and contact lenses. If it's progressive, then we do try to use the stabilizing procedure to sort of freeze the cornea in its current state and prevent it from getting worse. We also work very hard to modify risk factors. And I know I've mentioned this many times already, and I'm gonna mention it again. We want to prevent and minimize eye rubbing and also treat any underlying conditions that could cause the patient to rub, anything that causes itching, such as allergies or blepharitis. Some challenging aspects of treatments in patients uh, who have Down syndrome for keratoconus. Uh, not everybody is able to get a contact lens fitting. Not, not everybody is even able to tolerate glasses. So there definitely are some challenges um, with some of the interventions that we are able to easily do in the typical uh, patient population. Um, also talking about corneal transplants, they're much more difficult um, and the, the long-term transplant survival is lower um, in patients with Down syndrome than in the general population. And a lot of it has to do with this propensity for eye rubbing. Um, there are also higher risks during general anesthesia. And there's a lot of aftercare for these big surgeries such as corneal transplants that include many visits to the doctor, numerous eye drops and things like that. So if we can, we obviously want to try to avoid um, having to go through a, a corneal transplant with our patients with, with Down syndrome. Let's talk about corneal collagen crosslinking. So this procedure um, works by, actually the, the purpose of the procedure is basically to strengthen the tissues of the cornea. So in, the, in keratoconus, the cornea is very, very um, non-rigid, it's soft. Um, and it becomes more soft as the, as the disease progresses. So if you could see here on the left side, you could see there are few cross links that hold the corneal layers together, making it this malleable uh, structure. What we do with um, cross-linking is we soak the cornea in a, a vitamin B solution called riboflavin, and then we expose that cornea to UV light. And the interaction between the riboflavin in the corneal layers and the UV light creates these strong crosslinks that then um, make the cornea more rigid um, and more resistant to deformation and changing of shape. So here are the steps of the uh, crosslinking procedure. Step one is we place a speculum in the eyelids to keep them open so that the patient doesn't have to worry about blinking. It's made of metal, it's not painful, but it can be a little uncomfortable to put that in. Step two is we remove the surface layer with, of the cornea. That step is painless and is usually done under uh, topical anesthesia with just eye drops. Step three, um, we soak the cornea by actually putting little eye drops of vitamin B onto the cornea itself. And step four, this is the cross-linking machine. At the end of it right here, there is a UV lamp 
And we actually put that over the eye and we expose the cornea to this localized UV light. Um, after that's completed, we place a little bandage contact lens on the surface of the eye. The um, surface layer that we removed heals over about two to three days, um, and then the contact lens is removed. Um, there is some aftercare for this uh, procedure, and it involves um, some eye drops, usually antibiotic and anti-inflammatory drops, absolutely no eye rubbing during the healing period, and then wearing sunglasses for several weeks um, whenever outside after this procedure. Um, I wanted to make some comments outside of this uh, presentation. So if we can just uh, let's see how I can close that off. Can somebody help me just put my, um... there we go. Thank you so much. So I wanted to make some comments before I end about, um, you know, how do we determine whether your child uh, or a person who has uh, keratoconus needs to have cross-linking or a transplant or contact lenses. How do we go through that process? So we generally like to see, uh, you know, you're gonna get, your pediatrician is going to check your child's vision and they're going to probably be one of the first caregivers that are going to, that is going to determine whether your child's vision is uh, fully normal or subnormal. If there is, a decline in vision or not perfect vision, you know, you should be seen by uh, an eye care professional. Um, and then if there's a suspicion for keratoconus based on some of the things that I told you on the eye exam or on some imaging studies, um, then you, your child may need to see a specialist, either a general ophthalmologist who uh, works with cornea or a corneal specialist um, who is uh, specially trained to look at corneal disease. Um, after you have established uh, a relationship with the, with this person, uh, you will be your child will be monitored over time to see if their keratoconus is progressive or not. During this period of time, every attempt will also be made to correct uh, the child's vision, either with glasses or with contact lenses, if possible. If the keratoconus is then determined to be progressive, um, then um, we discuss the possibility of cross-linking. And not everybody is going to be a good candidate for cross-linking. It really depends on um, the patient themselves uh, and a lot of different other medical uh, things that we take into consideration. Um, most typical patients receive cross-linking under just eye drop anesthesia, just little eye drops and we do it in the office. It takes an hour. Um, but for some of my patients um, who have a Down syndrome, uh, they are unable to tolerate the speculum in their eyelid or just, you know, sort of the... Uh, stress of the operation in the office. And so we sometimes consider doing this under general anesthesia. Um, we also weigh um, some of the pros and cons of going through with the procedure rather than not going through with it, such as behavioral issues and, and propensity for eye rubbing. And is the patient going to be able to tolerate eye drops afterwards and not rub their eyes? So every case is handled on a, you know, really a case by case basis. Um, uh, but there are definitely options out there and there are a lot of people who are working on, um, you know, spreading the word about um, keratoconus, uh, the importance of diagnosis of this condition, the importance of prevention of, of worsening of this condition by limiting eye rubbing and treating underlying uh, diseases that could contribute uh, to these behaviors, um, and also to the, you know, the other uh, procedures such as cross-linking for stabilization and occasionally corneal transplant uh, to rehabilitate the vision. Thank you so much. That's all I had. Thank you so much. Um, Mary, did you, we want to take questions or should we go right into John and Mark? Let's uh, have John and Mark tell their story. Perfect. Okay. Well, let me get to introducing two of my favorite people. John and Mark Cronin are a, truly a dynamic duo. John and Mark are the co-founders of John's Crazy Socks. John's affinity for crazy socks paired with his love of making people smile, which he does every day, makes the John's Crazy Socks mission clear. They want to spread happiness. John always tells me that he loves selling socks, socks, and more socks. 
they have a social mission and a, a social mission and they want to show what is possible when you give someone a chance they hire many individuals with different abilities which at ndss we love every day they demonstrate what people with differing abilities can do in addition to being a well-known businessman featured as john and mark were saying earlier on fox news uh, john is also a member of the national down syndrome society's board of directors which means that he's my boss so hopefully i'm doing a good job <laughs> um, both john and mark are frequent advocates at the local state and federal level to ensure that individuals with disabilities are treated equally and getting good health care John was diagnosed with keratoconus recently and worked with Dr. Ostrovsky. John, the floor is all yours to share more about your story and how the Dr. Ostrovsky helped you. Well, thank you for having us. I thank you so much. Uh, I, I'm so careful. Um, oh, um, we, well, we appreciate this opportunity. What we want to do is share some of our experiences because, as Colleen says, John, um, has been diagnosed with keratoconus, and, and we hope that sharing some of those experiences will help others and maybe um, inspire some others to get good treatment. So, when did you first notice you having trouble with your eyesight? Um, my first one is uh, I found um, a swing a high. Um, swing a high. A swing a high. And what was the problem? I, um, I had trouble seeing seeing the board. Uh, I, I a boy oh, 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 way, way too far. So we took him to an ophthalmologist who um, prescribed some glasses, and you wore those for a while, right? I, I've, I've been I've been with it a while. Uh, and, there was no keratoconus in that diagnosis. Then uh, John still had trouble, and we would notice him squinting a lot. We took him for another eye exam. And that's when you were first diagnosed with keratoconus, and that was four years ago, maybe. Um, and one of the treatments that doctor recommended was that you get hard contact lenses. Yes, I did. So they were thick and hard contact lenses that were specially made, and you spent months learning how to put them in. I did. I did. Right, and we. We've shared some of those videos elsewhere. I think they're going to show them related to this uh, this talk. Um, when you finally learned, it was with a device where you. I I I I, I it's a little like a a, a golf a golf uh, tee a golf tee and and I uh, I it's a little bit uh, able. Right, you had a light coming to it. A light into it, and I. I put I put I, I tell I tell to my head down and um um uh, you would lower I, your I, head, I head lower and your that's head. how you put them in yeah right but you kept at it I and did. you learned how to do it I and did. now you have no trouble putting your contacts in do you no troubles no but we were concerned that this was getting worse the yeah. first ophthalmologist had decided that John might be uh, a candidate for crosslink, um, but would not be a candidate for a cornea transplant. And that doctor, um, well, let's just say we wound up finding Dr. Ostrowski through a uh, presentation she gave to the National Down Syndrome Society. Right. Um, we were fortunate enough to be able to schedule an appointment. Uh, we live out on Long Island outside New York City. Dr. Ostrowski has an office in Manhattan. We went in, and the first thing we noticed was Dr. Ostrowski was actually treating the patient. Um, and this may sound obvious, but we know doctors don't always talk to John. Sometimes they'll talk to uh, the parents, but Dr. Ostrowski, right from the beginning, was talking to you, right? Yes. And you liked that. I do. And she explained everything to John. She explained it to us as well but explained everything to John. And uh, Dr. Ostrowski noticed, uh, noted that she thought John could be a candidate both for cross-linking and if necessary for a cornea transplant because she was able to assess the patient, right? And everything you could do. All right. Now, unfortunately, 
one of John's eyes, the lens had become too thin for the cross linking. But the other eye was still at a point where we could do cross linking. So Dr. Ostrowski arranged to do that. But there was a lot of prep work, right? Yeah. The doctor explained everything to you? Yes. Told you everything that was going to happen? Yeah. Right? Took you into the room where it would happen? Used the device, I think Dr. Ostrowski referred to it as a speculum, to open your eye? Had you practice with some drops? Had you wear goggles? Right? I did, and I ate and I slept with them. Right? Um, you slept with them to wear them, right? You go all the way, don't you? I did. Right? And the day of the procedure, you were a little nervous. Yes, I am. A little nervous, but Dr. Ostrowski had prepared you. And you went in and laid down, right? Dr. Ostrowski explained everything to you. And she even played music you liked. You liked that, didn't you? I <laughs> did. Um, and after it, Dr. Ostrowski had prepared you to have some pain. But there wasn't that much pain. You were OK, right? Yes, I did. And you wore the goggles for a couple of weeks? I did. And now what do you wear when you go out? Sunglasses. Sunglasses. You look like some spy or something. Oh, right? I, I, I probably am more like some spy. James Bond in your glasses, huh? All right. Are you glad you had that procedure done? I did. Did it help? Yeah, I, yeah, I, I, I it's really help. It's really helpful. And would you recommend it to other people? Yes, mm -hmm. I, I, uh, well, I, I recommend uh, other people um, showing. Showing, um, uh, uh, showing, uh, um, producer. Right. Do you want to make sure they get the treatment they need? I get right? the treatment, and uh, our. And we're going to have a long relationship with Dr. Ostrowski. Yeah. Because we have to keep monitoring your eyes, right? Yeah. Right. You like that? I do. Right. So, for parents out there. Um, you know, what we can share, we're not experts, is one, you know, believe, believe in your son, your daughter. Um, you can do a lot, can't you? Right. Um, make sure you find a doctor who can, who knows Karakotonis. Um, you know, the medical experts here can address it, but it does seem to be sometimes a tricky diagnosis or not. Not every doctor, not you know, your GP is not going to recognize it. Right. I think GP may be an old bear term. Right. And my friend, um, all right. But um, an early diagnosis helps because then you'd learn not to be rubbing your eyes. And you rub your eyes. You used to rub your eyes a lot, right? I used to. Right. Um, and and, um, and find a doctor who's going to treat the patient. Yes. Talk to the patient. Right. You and like it when doctors talk to you, right? I did, and uh, I want. I want my friend um, uh, go to a, a, a my friend are uh, going to a, uh, a, a go to see a, 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 a getting treatment to for Dr. Osowski. Uh, the idea of doc I I I I my you. It turns out not everybody can go to see Dr. Osowski though, but there are many other doctors like Dr. So and others across the country. And in fact, the Curacatona Foundation can help people find good doctors. Yes. So that's our piece. We'll be glad to answer questions. Um, you're a good patient? Yes, I am. You, gotta, you listen to the doctor? That's a good way to be. Yeah, I, I, doctor orders. Doctor's orders. You follow orders. You're a rule follower. Right. Now I'm a different story. <laughs> uh, like, uh, I like it. I still live with you. You too got to live with me for a while. Right? <laughs> okay. Well, I hope that helps folks. Thanks so much. Mary, you're muted. muted. Mary, we still can't hear you, unfortunately.
Let's see. Can you hear oh, me yeah, now? Perfect. Yay. Okay. I must have hit the mute. Um, thank you, Mark and John. That was great. I got questions for all three of our speakers tonight. So uh, let's start off with Dr. Saw. Here's a question. Uh, is it yes. common to have repeated eye muscle surgeries? Yes. Uh, I, I would like to say that everything that I do uh, has a 100% success rate. I certainly <laughs> don't. I, I certainly don't. I'm going to just tell you. Uh, so it is not unusual uh, for patients to have uh, one or two, um, even three surgeries. Yes. Okay. And here's another one that I think is for you. A parent, can a parent or caregiver give the child those drops you mentioned to make vision blurry in order to encourage or train their child to wear their glasses? Or is yes. it only done at the doctor's office? Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, those, uh, those are prescribed medications. So those are, atro it's called atropine. It's a dilating drop. So it will dilate the pupils to make it blurred so that, uh, you know, and they would have to use it for three days usually. It's like they would just one, two, three days, consecutive days to blur the vision so that they're forced to wear the glasses because without them, everything will be blurred. And hopefully after using the drops for three days, they'll get used to wearing the glasses and then they would carry over. Okay, so is that the same drops that we get when we go for an eye exam? If yeah, it's a it's, yeah oh. it's a little stronger medication. It, it, it has a longer half-life. So yes, it's, a, it's a similar to the medications that, the, that you receive when you go, go, to, go to the eye doctor, but it's a, much, it's a, it's a, it's a stronger uh, strength. Okay, here's an easy one. Here's a layup for John. And it's an it's a simple question. Did it hurt? You're mute. You're muted. You're muted. Yep. And I, I, I it's not I, I, I it's not hurting me. Um sometime uh, back uh, sometime uh, back and forth. Well, during the procedure, were you in any pain? No. No. It was maybe a little uncomfortable at times. Yeah. The next day, you felt a little discomfort, right? Right. But you didn't take any pain medication. We had that, but you didn't need it. I know that. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Here we go. That's a, a ringing endorsement. Here's a couple for Dr. Ostrowski. Uh, can you be asleep during cross-linking? I think my child would do better if they weren't awake. I mean, we and, prefer, and you're muted. obviously, no, go ahead. Now I can hear you. Um, we try our best to do this procedure under local anesthesia, but um, there are times when we can do this under general anesthesia, yes, for, partic for particular patients. Great. Here's another question. My daughter is 29 years old. What is the likelihood that she will develop keratoconus? So keratoconus usually starts in the teenage years and the early 20s. So frequently, if somebody doesn't have any signs of keratoconus by the age of 29 or 30, uh, and they are not an aggressive eye rubber, most likely they will not develop it. Um, it would be unusual. Uh, but if somebody has developed keratoconus in the early to mid 20s, it can get worse in the 20s and 30s. And it can actually get worse at any age if there is continuous eye rubbing. Okay, here's one that's uh, interesting. Is there a sense of urgency for a corneal transplant if your keratoconus is very progressive? There is no sense of urgency for a corneal transplantation usually. Most of the time, you know, the time to restore vision uh, that is really critical is before the age of about eight or nine years old. Uh, this is in general. And most patients who have keratoconus are way beyond the period where it's critical to restore vision for the normal visual pathways to form. So, so no, once you are sort of beyond um, the limit for cross-linking, which does have sort of an expiration date if your cornea gets too thin, uh, the corneal transplant can actually be undertaken at any, at any point, at any time. Dr. Saw, can you uh, comment about cornea transplants in the Downs community? Have you, uh, what, what are the, some of the considerations that a parent or caregiver might have? 
Regarding which, I'm sorry, regarding which well, topic? Corneal transplants. Uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, Anne actually did a beautiful job on, on the um, on corneal issues with the Down syndrome. Okay. Uh, but just in general, just in general, um, the uh, the this the keratoconus is developed in during their teenage years, uh, during their teenage years. So by the time they require corneal transplant, I don't know how many uh, corneal transplants that you have done and uh, in during teenage years, but uh, it's usually it's it's a latter part. It's like I would say probably into their twenties. So um, the uh, the, uh, obviously, there are other options that we would consider before doing corneal transplant for keratoconus. Uh, so I personally don't have any patients who actually had corneal transplant from keratoconus in Down syndrome patients. Of course, I actually have uh, patients with the other conditions like a, a trauma. It's actually trauma is actually one of the most common cause of uh, reasons for needing corneal transplant. And, uh, the uh, it, it really requires patients just like John. John, John just said it just perfectly. Uh, you know, they, you have to follow the instructions very carefully and and, and show up for the appointments uh, because the uh, the tr the surgery is actually the easy part. Is the follow up that actually uh, determines the success of the, uh, the the surgery. And and that follow up goes on almost for a lifetime. Is it's that true? For life, it's it's a yeah. lifetime. It's a truly a lifetime. So. You know, uh, so all my patients with the who actually had corneal transplants and also patients with Down syndrome, these are my the they're not I don't think of them as my patients. I actually think of them as lifelong friends <laughs> because I will get to know their you know their mothers, grandparents, sisters, and brothers. It's like extended family, and I love it. <laughs> <laughs> all right, last question for for both of my doctors, and maybe Marka and John want to jump in too. My daughter will not stop rubbing her eyes. Even though we remind her to stop, she seems to do it often and many times a day. What are your tips? So everybody give me a tip for stopping eye rubbing. One thing I would say is uh, make sure that she doesn't have any underlying conditions that are causing the eye rubbing, like allergies or blepharitis. Those are treatable. Um, so that's the first thing. Okay. So it really I'll depends leave the on the third thing. Yeah, go ahead, doctor. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, please. Uh, so it really depends on the age of the patient. Uh, so this is actually very important. And of course, if this is a very young patient who cannot understand the uh, the, the the dangers of eye rubbing, uh, let's say the child is between two to three. Uh, sometimes, actually, I do. Uh, we would actually do a comprehensive, very thorough exam and determine, try to determine the underlying cause and try to address it. But the thing is that if the, if the child has a blepharitis and they rub it and develop a edema and additional inflammation, then it irritates more. So it's like a vicious cycle. They can't break that cycle. So sometimes you're going to have to break that cycle in some way. So we may actually, I may contact the pediatricians for some help. And also uh, sometimes we actually do use arm restraints like elbow, I don't know if you've seen those, it's called no-nos. So we actually put that on for a couple of hours a day. Uh, so if they rub a lot, then we just put the arm restraint and use it as a negative reinforcement for a couple of hours a day to remind them to not to rub. So sometimes you're gonna have to, uh, uh, you're gonna have to show some tough love. It's, it, it's, it's a very, very difficult situation. I totally understand and empathize. Mark um, and John, I know you have to leave soon, but can you give us a, a tip I, on how to avoid eye rubbing other than wearing goggles, or is that your tip? <laughs> well, I can, I can share in a, a perhaps a somewhat parallel situation. John's older brother, when he was in junior high, had asthma and had to use an inherent, an inherent take of steroid. And the doctor warned him that every time he used it, he had to use mouthwash and really clean his mouth because if he didn't, he would develop thrush. So we spoke about that, but all I did was have him go look up pictures of thrush. And once he saw the pictures, he, it wasn't dad telling him anymore. He understood and he didn't want that. So perhaps there's some motivation there you know, John is somebody who, if a doctor tells him to do something, likes to follow rules. But perhaps that woman's daughter 
if she understood what would really happen if she kept rubbing her eyes, maybe that would lead to a change in behavior. But I'm just a dad. You got medical experts here. That that's no, that's a very good good tip. You have a question? Yeah, I, I have a question. Go ahead. Um, um, oh, when when you wash uh, wash your face, uh, wash your uh, wash your face, uh, is that okay? Oh, oh, wash the oh, oh, wash your face. Uh, oh, wash your eyes. I, I, yeah, yes. Uh, uh, that that's good. Is that possible? Yes. John, yes, it is okay to gently wash your eyelashes and your eyes. It is perfectly okay, John. By the way, John, you're like every doctor's dream. You're like a perfect patient. I love it. I'm kind of <laughs> jealous of Anne. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, uh, l last week, uh, we taped an in-depth conversation between Dr. Ostrowski and the Cronins talking about uh, uh, John's journey. Uh, uh, if you're interested in hearing more of the uh, John and Mark show, <laughs> that audio tape will be posted on our website soon. And if you're interested in listening to this presentation again, or you want to share it with other families, uh, a recording of tonight's web, uh, webinar will be available on both the NDSS and the NKCF uh, website soon. Uh, it seems like this is a good time to put in a commercial for John's Crazy Socks. <laughs> Right. As, Colleen, yeah, as Colleen told you, John and his dad are in business together and have a successful operation where they spread happiness and cover up toes. Uh, take a moment to visit John's Crazy Socks. That's J-O-H-N-S-C-R-A-Z-Y-S-O-C-K-S dot com. You can read John's story. You can be inspired. And mostly you can buy some socks. All right, See? I'll get some socks. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, in closing, I want to thank our partner, the NDSS, for co-hosting. And I want to encourage anybody who's watching uh, to visit our website, NKCF. Colleen, you want to say good night? Yes, thank you so much to all of our panelists. John and Mark, thank you so much. It's good to see you guys again. Thank you. Can I interrupt one second? I just of thought there, if there are any parents out there that think we could help at all, they can reach me through our uh, website and we'll be glad to talk to them. That's terrific. John and Mark are truly the best. We, lo we love them. And as I said, I, I'm not paid to say this, even though John technically is my boss. <laughs> 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 Thank you all so much for joining us again. Thank you to our panelists. Um, like, yeah. like Mary said, you can visit both of our websites to learn more. And October is Down Syndrome Awareness Month. So it is the perfect time to purchase your John's Crazy Socks and put them on before the end of the month. So thank you so much for, our, for everyone for being here this evening. Thanks. Thank Good you. night. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Good night.